It has been one month since we started using and testing our three Mac Studios, and in that time, we have made a bunch of discoveries, including a few breakthrough ones just a few days ago about specific hardware limitations with the Mac Studio that explain a lot of the issues that we have found and talked about in our previous videos. In this one month real world review, I will be talking about all of that, including my honest experience with these Mac Studios and what I think about them if they are worth purchasing or upgrading to compared to previous iMacs and other desktops uh, and the few personal dilemmas that I have with the Mac Studio in general. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. People have been waiting for a desktop like this for many years now. Now yes, we did have the Mac Mini, but that had a bunch of limitations including not having an actual dedicated graphic graphics card, which was its biggest weakness. Now we made a bunch of videos on eGPUs, comparing different ones and seeing if it's worth it for your use case. So a lot of people use those to speed them up, but because of inefficiencies and bandwidth limitations, for a lot of people, they just did not make sense compared to buying an iMac or a MacBook. Well, we finally have a serious desktop Mac that is relatively affordable compared to the Mac Pro, which comes in a nice form factor that I have to say is so easy to carry around with you and it is just a pleasure to use and to hold and to experience. It's definitely nice. Now, I have to say I have been loving the system and I've been loving all the I.O. Who would have thought that Apple would give us front port and a front SD card reader? I think that's probably because Johnny Ive is no longer there. So I am very thankful for that. And even on the base model, these two front ports that are not Thunderbolt, they are USB-C that is twice the speed of the previous ones and the SD card supports really fast speeds as well. Now, with my previous uh, Mac Mini and also even the iMac, one big limitation was being limited with Thunderbolt ports and this has four on the back and not only are they Thunderbolt, they each have their own controller, meaning that you could split these out without being limited with bandwidth. So that's been really nice. We have 10 gigabit ethernet. As far as IO, this thing is awesome. And I also wanna talk about fan noise because on stage, Apple said that this thing runs really cool and you can't really hear it for the most part, but I think they understated that because even maxing out the GPU and the CPU completely, the fans stayed at idle and the temperatures are extremely low. Like people literally commented and said, that doesn't seem right, that's too low. But in fact, that is how cool this thing runs. So Apple definitely over engineered it. Now for those of you guys that need a desktop because of multiple displays, it is awesome to see that even the base model can support up to five displays, four 6K XDR high resolutions and a 4K display. So it's cool that Apple didn't limit it. Now there is no doubt that this is an amazing machine, but the elephant in the room is the price point. Because previously you could buy a 5K iMac for 1800 bucks that included a computer, a beautiful 5K display, a keyboard and a mouse for that price. And now even the base model is $2,000. And then if you add on Apple's genuine accessories, you're looking at close to $4,000 for a system which is crazy. Now sure, if you buy a base $2,000 Mac Studio, that will be more powerful than the iMac, but it still is a lot of money. So realistically, this thing is not only replacing the iMac that they dropped from their lineup to get you to spend more money on a system that's split up, and it's replacing also the iMac Pro. So with that, does this thing really hold up in terms of performance to a high-end system before, and is it worth it? Well, I will say after a month of use, heck yeah, it is worth it. Even if you're buying the base model, as long as you can actually make use of that performance. We have made a ton of performance videos and comparisons within the last month that go into extreme detail, testing out the system, comparing it to MacBooks, Mac minis, desktop custom Windows PCs and Intel Mac Pros and iMacs, along with a super detailed video comparing all three configurations of the Mac Studio. So if you guys want an insane amount of detail, you guys can check those out. But in this video, I wanna go over the top level kind of thoughts and perspectives on performance. Now, before I jump into that, 
I wanna let you guys know that if you guys enjoy the videos and the testing, please subscribe down below. Help us to reach our goal of 1 million subscribers. We would greatly appreciate it. And use the merch code right there to save 20% off on some of these new hoodies and shirts and other merch that we have. Now the M1 Max, Mac Studios have the same performance as Apple's latest laptops, which seems kind of like a bummer at first, but you have to keep in mind that those MacBooks not only destroyed the Intel MacBooks they replaced, but even the higher end iMacs that have desktop chips including the iMac Pro. Not only that, it even embarrassed my $15,000 Intel-based Mac Pro, uh, which was really, really surprising. Now, for people that look at simple benchmarks and looking at their raw graphics performance, well, of course, the Mac Pro does beat it out. But the crazy thing about Apple Silicon is that there are so many other efficiencies and improvements that make real-world usage much faster. For example, we have the unified memory design and with that we have tile memory so when a program is optimized for it the graphics doesn't have to send the data back to the cpu back to the ram and then back and forth it stays there and because of that many real world tasks are so much faster this means that even if you had a high-end imac pro a two thousand dollar mac studio can actually outperform that so don't think you have to buy the four thousand dollar model or up to eight thousand dollars if you spec that out now the M1 Ultra, on the other hand, is a whole nother beast. The CPU performance is extraordinary, but with that, the GPU, well, it's a bit hit or miss, but let's touch on the CPU first. Some people say, why do you need a faster and faster and faster computer? Why do you need to keep upgrading? Well, that is true. Even the M1 Mac mini is great for a lot of people, but if you are somebody that is pushing these computers to their maximum, especially if you're making money with it, it can make a significant difference. Having 20 CPU cores with the M1 Ultra, along with higher amounts of RAM that are much much, much faster and have more channels can make a huge difference. For example, for Lightroom photo editing, this performance is unheard of, even with high-end overclocked water-cooled custom PCs with Intel's latest 12th gen. For the people that can make use of it, spending the extra $1,600 going from the base model up to an M1 Ultra with 48 graphics cores and 64 gigabytes of RAM can make a world of a difference. For example, I know somebody that is literally gonna make an extra thousand to $1,500 a month on these speed improvements because instead of sitting there watching everything load and process, for example, when you're doing photo merge, you're doing HDR, you literally get that work done twice as fast or even more than before. And if you're doing a lot of projects and you're going off of you know a flat rate price, which they are, you can make make back that difference in price in a month. And in within a year, that's an extra $10,000 of income. And then of course, if you have a team that's working on stuff like this, these Macs and these new chips with new faster CPUs can make a massive difference. This is why the Mac Studio, specifically the M1 Ultra, is an absolutely incredible product where even a high-end Mac Pro that costs way more can't touch it. And you have this form factor and this price. Now, the M1 Ultra, on the CPU side, you don't need to get the higher end 64 core. This is where we need to talk about the graphics. When Apple announced their chip, they made some huge claims about the GPU performance. Not only that, it used so little power, but they talked about how it compares to a 12900K with an RTX 3090 GPU. So people People were expecting it to compete and to be honest and fair in some tests like GFX bench it does get close but in our detailed testing we found that well it does kind of fall flat and for a couple different reasons. First off, one thing that almost nobody notices on that graph that they showed off, the RTX 3090 was only shown up to just over 300 watts of power, and then compared to the M1 Ultra, which at 200 watts less can perform slightly better. When people see that chart that's up there for a few seconds, you think, wow, this is beating out the RTX 3090. That's what everybody talked about, but in fact, that graphics card does not use just above 300 watts, it uses a lot higher. So if you're using it the way it's designed, it is quite a bit more powerful. 
Now for the things that Apple really optimized for, like video editing, this thing is quite a bit faster. But for other things that bottleneck the system or it's just not designed for, Windows PCs are quite a bit faster, specifically for things that use ray tracing. For example, Blender with OptiX is just screaming. Now we went in and we tested out a bunch of real world tests, both photo editing, different applications, Photoshop, After Effects, video editing, and we saw some cases where the 64 core barely performed any faster than the 48 core, and some cases where even the M1 Ultra chips were not much faster than the $2,000 base model. And that really got us thinking and researching more. We found that in one specific test that pushes both the CPU and GPU really hard, the 64 core was barely faster and it throttled down to all the way down to like 700 megahertz instead of 1300 and the wattage just wasn't there. Now the highest wattage we ever saw used was 87 watts where Apple on stage showed off 105 and for perfect proper scaling, it should be 120 watts if you're going off of just the standard M1 chip scaled up, which is what the M1 Ultra is. So we started looking into what the heck is going on and I kind of told people overall, don't buy the 64 core option unless you absolutely know that your program is optimized. So we talked with multiple engineers, software, hardware, we have some extra information and we were shown with Xcode's mapping feature that even though the GPU is marked at 100% usage, half the time, literally, it is just sitting there not doing anything for a couple of reasons. Part of it's software optimization, and you guys have to know that just because an application is designed for uh, Apple Silicon and ARM does not mean that it's actually optimized for these chips with the tile memory and the unified setup. So half the time this Ultra, especially the higher end one, is could just be sitting there and is sitting there, which is why the Geekbench scores are so low and they don't scale. Now, uh, we got more information about what is limiting it. For example, in Blender, in, in certain cases where the wattage is so low, and that is actually a hardware design thing. These M1 chips were actually first starting to be designed up to seven years ago. Yes, that is incredible. And then about five years ago for you know these higher end versions, meaning that the kind of workloads that we're doing now, working with Blackmagic RAW, working with uh, this 8K footage and these crazy higher resolution things weren't around and they're based off of iPhones. So a lot of people have said, well, this is an iPhone chip and technically you are right. And because of that, there is a buffer in the chips that isn't very large. So when a uh, software is not optimized and it's throws, throwing huge chunks of data, you end up getting some slowdowns and bottlenecks while the GPU has to wait. It's almost like if you have a funnel and then you literally have this tiny little channel to pass through data. So if this data can't get to the GPU fast enough, the GPU is waiting for more information to try to kind of squeeze through. So half the time it is sitting there. And so if you're seeing that your M1 Ultra's graphics, there it's down clocking to 700 megahertz and the wattage is low, that is just because it's not getting data fast enough. Now we also got more info about can this be fixed and how much faster can it be? Well, on a hardware level, it cannot be changed. That's already sealed and scaled. And the more graphics cores there are, the more of this limitation of bottleneck you see, which is why the 64 core is hit way harder than a 24 core or 32 core M1 Max, which has very little bottlenecks. Now, some tests have been done, some software is being rewritten and uh, being you know fixed for this. And for example, the M1 Max model for 12K Blackmagic Raw has seen improvements up to two and a half times faster as far as the speed and that will be coming out. Now as the data is smaller or as uh, you have other bottlenecks, you might not see that big of a difference, but if software companies optimize and they fix how their program sends data, these M1 Ultras are going to get a lot faster. But the question is, and I mentioned this in my previous video, how long is that going to take? We have heard from different software developers that they haven't even received M1 Ultras yet. Apple does send out machines 
since some developers and others buy it and they're waiting, but because of the availability, it is taking time to get these optimizations to be made. So if you're buying a high-end one, expect to wait quite a bit. Now, this is also why I have to touch on Final Cut. We have been wanting to make a comparison for video editing, a very detailed one, including all the Macs, but Apple, even close to a month later, didn't release the Final Cut version that they advertised on stage for their performance numbers. Now, today, as I was shooting this video, they released it, I paused, we went and ran some tests, and unfortunately, the things where we saw bottlenecks in, they have not been fixed. In fact, in our toughest test, the highest end Mac actually got eight seconds slower. So that is a bummer. I don't know if they're working on it or what is happening, but we know that with future versions of Mac OS, there are gonna be some improvements as well. That is gonna take some time for that to come out. So if you're worried about getting the most bang for the buck from these systems, do know that you will have to wait. And with that, for full on hardware changes, we are gonna have to wait for the M2 chips, which will be you know, a ways out for these higher end ones. So with all of that, is the Mac Studio still worth it? Well, yeah, absolutely, especially if you are using the high-end CPU that can make a big difference for you. Now, as far as the GPU, well, it will never be as fast as an RTX 3090, especially if you're using a program like Blender, which has the ray tracing cores that are utilized to make it so much faster. Even when the software is updated, which will take a while, it will not touch that. Now, we do know that Apple is working on ray tracing for future chips that will come out in the future but for now, this is not gonna be a powerhouse for those types of uses. Now, for other people that are working with photos, illustrations, coding is insanely fast, video editing, in these areas, these systems are incredible. I know some of you guys asked if you're buying the base model, should you upgrade to the 32 core graphics? I think for 200 bucks, yes, if you're using graphics, you're really pushing it, it is worth it. But this is where my personal dilemma comes in. I made a video saying, do not buy the $2,000 Mac Studio. That is because for the first time ever, we have a MacBook that has the same performance as the Mac Studio with the M1 Max. In the past, MacBooks not only were a lot slower, they were limited in performance, but they also thermal throttled. But now Apple gave us this insanely good MacBook and this Mac Studio that's a desktop, but it doesn't utilize any extra clock speeds, any extra performance. So personally, unless you know that you need a desktop and you need five displays instead of having three displays with the MacBook, or maybe, I don't know, for some other reason, you really wanna have a desktop, I think it's worth spending a little bit more money getting that beautiful display, the XDR display that's really nice, getting the speakers, the keyboard, the trackpad, the battery with the capability to take it to go, and using that as a desktop solution that you just plug in. I think you get so much more value, and it might run a little bit hotter than this, but the performance is the same. Now on the flip side, if you are somebody that can make use of the extra performance of the M1 Ultra chip, that $4,000 model that I recommend, that is where this computer is a game changer. And it can even beat out a 28 core Mac Pro in terms of Xcode and in photo work and a lot of different CPU applications and graphics that are optimized. It is incredible and it is actually a great value compared to the, you know, buying an iMac Pro in the past, people spend 10 grand or a Mac Pro. It is a really nice machine. So there you guys go. If you have any questions, let me know down in the comment section below. I will do my best to answer them. We will be doing that triple comparison. We're gonna dive into video editing. So if you guys wanna see that with Premiere Pro and Adobe um, and also DaVinci Resolve, click that circle above to subscribe to help us reach our goal of 1 million subscribers. We'd appreciate it. Check out one of those great videos right over there. This has been Max and I'll see you in the next video.